The sage had entered into the heart of another in order to study the nature of dream. But this person whose body he entered died, was reduced to ashes, and so was his original body. But he didn't know that because he was caught up in another dream, another life. And he's now living a life of the ascetic in contemplation of the nature of consciousness. What is the cause for the appearance of this body, as nothing can arise without a cause? Well, this is a question, isn't it? Why should we have this body? Why should we have this human body with its two arms and its two legs and all the rest of it? This is the body that we have in our dreams as well, although that's open to some variation. Actually, there isn't anything special about this body. Consciousness can take on any kind of body. It can take on the body of a spider, the body of a jellyfish, the body of a rock, and so on. But that's not what we're concerned with here. It is said that it is delusion. I think dream might be a better word. It's dream which we take as reality. Then what is the cause for this delusion? Who is it that sees this delusion? and who thinks about it, so rather than get caught up with asking what is the cause of all this, we go further, we pursue deeper, we pursue the inquiry deeper, never mind the nature of the delusion, who is suffering from this delusion, who is experiencing this delusion, who is it that sees this delusion and who thinks about it, he in whose heart I lived as the experiencer and I together have been reduced to ashes. So now he knows that body he inhabited and his original body are ashes. But here he is. Therefore I exist in pure consciousness, which is devoid of action, the doer and the instruments. What exists is not even the appearance of the infinite consciousness, but it is pure consciousness. How can it become an appearance? Who is the seer of this appearance? It's just like we call the whole variety of experience a dream. It's all a manifestation of consciousness. Whether we call it dream or waking, it's all a manifestation of consciousness. So these questions are not being asked in a philosophical manner. These questions are being asked to point us right back to this consciousness. This consciousness which is the only experiencer. Thus, I continue to live in this objective world without any mental agitation, without support or dependence and without vanity. And this support or dependence is to do with dependence on ideas, notions, beliefs. I do what has to be done at the appropriate moment, but I do nothing. He's going through the actions of being an ascetic. What happens, happens. The sky, the earth, wind, etc. are but one self. All the elements are the body of consciousness. In a dream, everything in a dream is an element of the dream. Everything is an element of consciousness. I am at peace, free from injunctions and prohibitions, without even the division between inside and outside. There's no inside or outside. As I had been living like this, you approached me by coincidence. It just happens. Thus have I told you all about dreams, about us and about this creation. Knowing this, be at peace. Nirvana will arise by itself, or nothing may happen. Truth is stumbled upon. The hunter's been exposed to the teachings, but the hunter's not yet stumbled upon the truth. The hunter said, in that case, we shall all become unreal. I was talking about what I'm doing here with somebody recently, and they asked me, what well, am I not just talking about nihilism or nihilism? And for me, nihilism has got a certain despondent air to it. 
I could see how it could be construed as nihilism, saying none of this is real. Give up all belief. Give up hope. And the Asian wisdom is often seen as quite unappealing to the Western mind because it seems to be fatalistic and nihilistic. And it's not, not at all, not at all. And I immediately wanted to start saying how positive it all was. But there wasn't actually any words I could use to convey the positive and vibrant nature of what's being indicated here. No words can do it justice. All I could say is, no, it's not nihilistic. I think in retrospect, though, I suppose I could, I could have pointed out, well, nihilism is also a belief. It's the belief that nothing is true. Nothing is of any intrinsic value. And this isn't what's being taught. Such statements might be made, but that's only so we loosen our attachment to them. We loosen our identification with these notions and beliefs. And we identify with what all these notions and beliefs arise within. It's like having this wonderful toy, but being more interested in the box and somehow feel that if, we're, if the box is taken away from us, then we're going to be bereft. But we're failing to see the wonderful toy that the box contained. The sage continued, True, all these beings are real to one another. To the extent they perceive one another, they experience one another. You have heard all this, but you do not rest in the truth. Only by constant practice does this truth become fully established. I think the hunter must have had some inclination of the truth. He's no longer a seeker, he's a practitioner. And it can take a while to become established in this truth. This is what the Yoga Visitor is about. It's an aid to help us be established in this truth. I wonder if I should say anything about the first couple of sentences. We're all real to one another in the sense that we grant reality to each other. You have a perception of me, so you'll grant me some reality. Although your understanding of my reality might be completely different to somebody else's understanding of my reality, which could be quite different to my own understanding of my reality. It's when we start looking into it that we see how notional and therefore unreal it all is. And this is part of our constant practice, this inquiring into what we mean by the reality of others, of the world and of ourselves.